This picture was taken in 1960 at the 14th Chess Olympiad in Leipzig, Germany. So it depicts Bobby Fischer playing against Mikhail Tal, and the game that they're actually playing is the one that I want to analyze today. It's a really fun little game. I've never actually seen this before. I stumbled across it, wanted to show you guys this game, and I also wanted to cover a Fischer versus Tal game because obviously I cover a lot of Firuja videos on this channel, and I've had quite a few comments from people saying, oh, Ali Reza reminds me of Fischer, or he reminds me of Tal, or a mixture of the two. So I was curious to actually open this up as a question and ask you guys, you know, does Ali Reza remind you of Bobby at all? Does he remind you of Tal? Now don't get me wrong, those guys have got a whole great legacy behind them. They were amazing players. I'm not saying that Ali Reza's at their levels right now. He's still growing as a player and learning. Long way to go. Who knows where his chess career will go? But I'm just curious, in these early days, when you see his style, you see him playing, does he remind you at all of Bobby Fischer? Does he remind you of Tal? Maybe another player? Maybe a mix of players? So I'm curious for your thoughts. I'd appreciate them down below. I'll try and get back to everyone. But this game right now, I want to look at because it really shows a good example of their styles. Very attacking, very aggressive, very tactical at times as well. This is a fun game, so let's see what happened here. So Bobby kicked off with his favorite pawn to e4. Tal went pawn e6, the French defense. We had pawn d4, pawn d5, and now knight c3 invites the razor sharp winnower variation, which Tal goes in for with bishop to b4. So the pawn kicks on to e5. Now this one came to c5. Pawn a3, all very standard theory, but here Tal goes his own way. So most commonly we see black taking on c3, doubling the pawns, but here we had this retreat variation. As I understand from some reading, a lot of Armenian players used to play this, developed some of the theory. So when that bishop drops back here, white then goes pawn b4, breaking that pin, and the main way for black to play here, there's pressure on this c5 pawn of course, is takes on d4. Now you don't want to be recapturing with the queen. The thing about these positions is it's all about initiative. You want to keep generating threats. So if you take with the queen, after the bishop drops back, then you're running into knight c6 in a moment, black's getting big pressure on the center. So instead of taking there, Fischer jumped the queen out here. Just to mention, by the way, knight b5 is also a good move in that position, another very theore theoretical move. Now, when you come to g4, a standard idea in these structures, you hit g7, then you'll be taking the rook. So black has to respond. Knight e7 is standard, preparing to meet this move with rook to g8. Now we had takes on a5 from Fischer, and Tal captures on c3, so they've both won minor pieces, and already we've got this really interesting pawn structure on the board. So Fischer now chops on g7, and he's not just pawn grabbing for the sake of it, because after rook g8, he snaffles another one. There's actually an idea here for white of using this past h-pawn now. In some positions, at the right moment, that pawn actually gets going all the way down the board. White wants to queen it. It's a very dangerous idea. So this knight now came to c6, and this is the point for black. You're lost on the king side now in the end games, so you want to pressure that center. Use your central pawn majority if you possibly can. So the pawn was attacked, knight f3 defends, queen c7 intensifies the pressure. And now the most accurate move here was actually bishop to f4, looks very natural. Now if black carries on developing with bishop to d7, which we saw in the game, then white can play this a6 move, which is quite nice. Bit of an uncomfortable question for black. Say you kick on with pawn b6, well then bishop d3 can come. And I like this variation because you're keeping pieces on the board and when white's got a bit more space here, these pieces are a bit on top of each other. It's a nice idea to keep pieces on the board, then look to play this in future when the timing's right. But Fischer didn't go bishop f4, he instead went bishop to b5, pinning the knight. But now after bishop d7, it's encouraging trades here, which helps black really, considering they've got this bad light squared bishop. Now again, bishop to f4 was best from Fischer. I should briefly say here actually that bishop d7 was played. If you take on g2 with the rook, 
this is no good after king to f1, then the rook drops back, then rook g1, these ones come off, and the point is that this king is just completely naked on the king side, checks are coming here, a piece could be landing on g5, a knight or a bishop, so that's why you can't take on g2, just to mention why bishop d7 was played instead, just developing. So here we had castles from Bobby, now castles queenside from Tal, and again, best here would have just been, say, rook to e1, defending that pawn. But instead, we had this super sharp, super aggressive bishop to g5, and the whole game just explodes now. So Tal plays the best move here, which is takes on e5. Now, already there's a piece hanging here. He's leaving his knight on e7 hanging, but that's immune. If you take it off immediately, then black takes on f3 using the pin of the pawn after the king goes then you've got rook to h8 and there's massive problems here all the pieces are converging on h2 you're about to get mated lose your queen and the whole thing's completely busted so you can't take on e7 now fisher took on e5 with the knight but just to show you if he takes the bishop here with check then the rook can recapture you can take on e5 queen recaptures and then you could snap on e7. Looks like you're about to pick up a rook, you've eliminated the defender, but then there's this sneaky rook h8 move. That's the saving grace. Now white can actually go bishop to f6 here, or rook a to e1, counterattack this queen. Black should still be a bit better, but you're not completely busted and getting mated. Okay, not the best way to play. So Fisher didn't take on d7. He instead took on e5 here, and now Tal didn't take back with the queen here. Again, that was an option. Instead, he took on b5. Once again, we've got stuff hanging everywhere. So the rooks attacked on f1, but Fisher didn't move it. He instead took on f7 here. So he's now hitting this rook, but Tal ignored it. He took on f1. Fisher took on d8. And now you don't want to be recapturing that knight with either queen or king. Then you're walking in some really horrible pins here with the bishop. So instead, Tal took on g5. He picked up that dangerous bishop. It does walk into this fork now with knight takes on e6. Like I said, this game just goes completely nuts at this point. There's so much going on, I know. But here's Tal's response. This is absolutely awesome. Rook takes on g2 with check. And amazingly, the best move here is not taking the bishop. Now the rook can actually take on h2. Once again, you're hitting this queen. So the queen would have to move away here. And then you can start giving checks on c4, on h1. Black's a little bit better, but not necessarily decisive. So that's why you can't take on f1 here. Instead, king h1 was played, holding that h2 pawn. But now the queen came to e5, it was attacked by the knight of course, had to save itself, a wonderful centralising square, so you hit the knight, you also hold this square here, there's no checks from the white queen, and you maintain this pressure on the h2 pawn as well. So you're tying down that white queen, there's not a lot Bobby can do, rook takes on f1 is really the only move in the position to keep the game going. Now Tal picks up on e6, but it does leave his rook to be taken. The king captured on g2, but now Tal can land this check on g4, and this was actually the final move of the game. They agreed a draw here, because Tal's just going to keep checking from f3. It's a perpetual by force. So a very fighting game, really exciting players, and I'm curious to know who you think is most like Ali Reza, or perhaps someone else. Thanks very much for watching. If you want to see my whole playlist previewing the candidates players for the upcoming tournament in June, then click here.